What is going on everybody? Your old pal Jimmo back again with another fantastic video here where we're going to be replacing the quarter panel on this Toyota. Now you can see where we're at. We've put on the new panel and that primer you're looking at the copper looking stuff is weld through primer in between the two joints. And what happens here is basically the damage is so severe on the original quarter that it didn't make any sense to try and straighten it or repair it using conventional ways with body filler. And that panel just gets drilled out and chiseled off and then a new one gets welded back in place or welded in with a combination of panel bond which is an epoxy based adhesive which can hold it around the edges but generally at the top joints here and at the bottom you need to have a solid weld anywhere where you have an open seam and then it gets straightened out a little bit with some body filler so we'll apply some body fillers in those areas block sand it all straight and then it's going to need some additional prep work now, on the prep side of things, what we're going to do here is taper off all of our hard edges. So what we see at the bottom there is some, some grinding marks. So when you're using a grinder to bring the welds down, it's going to take all of our paint edges and have them sort of stuck together. So what this process here is called feathering. So we're going to feather out each layer of paint so we can have a nice gradual taper rather than a hard edge. So when we go to prime this shortly, We'll, the primer will have some build to it and we can rebuild that area and level it back off using a block and some sandpaper. Now the rest of this panel we're going to go ahead and prime as well because mostly because you, you can't prime directly over E-coat which is that black coating that comes on new panels and the reason you can't prime directly on or paint directly on E-coat is because it's just not thick enough to provide a good foundation for your paint. So we're applying some edge primer here to all of the metal to protect that metal before we apply our primer surfacer which has the build to it and we could have used a direct to metal primer which we've done in several other videos we could have also used an epoxy a lot of different primer choices and i'll actually divert just momentarily you might have noticed some of the recent videos well the most recent video i've done where we break down the reasons for different paint variations and that's why one paint code could spawn multiple versions of the same color and why you have to blend color so if you haven't seen that video i highly recommend you check it out but what we're going to try to do is come up with some videos in a similar layout. So we're going to try and break down a lot of different operations and give you as much detailed information as possible in a nice easy to understand way. Because some of the feedback I'm getting out there is people especially that are new to this trade are having a hard time understanding and follow along, following along with what we're doing here. So hopefully that will help some people out. Uh, you can look forward to them coming out shortly. We're there in progress right now. One of the first ones to come out is on primers which I think you'll find quite useful because uh, priming can create a lot of confusion because there's a lot of different um, like there's the primer surfacers then there's wet and wet primers and you know, in North America you, you might come across them as sealers then you hear uh, adhesion promoters and there's different types of primers once you get into like etch primers, epoxy primers, urethane primers and uh, you'll come across terms like 2k and which can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people so we're gonna try to clear up some of those things and hopefully help out some people that are looking to get some information and uh, keep things also going with these job videos where we will just show you some cool paint jobs and such as this one with my brother where you can pick apart the work to your heart's content which I highly recommend you do because you know it's brotherly love you gotta you gotta wind up your siblings whenever you can Let's uh, just get back to this job. Uh, I've got a few other things I want to talk about, but let's just bring you back up to speed on where we're at here. So he's got his SATA 5000, uh, putting down a clear blender. So he's going to just put that over the blend panels to fill in any sand scratches and then apply some color over the primer area on the door. But yeah, some other videos that we have planned I want to talk about too is some cool aerosol jobs. So I've actually picked up an aerosol machine and I'll be able to make whatever color I want and spray it in an aerosol. And I've also been informed that we can do the same thing with 2K products. And if you don't know what 2K products are, you can either wait for one of those videos or I'll tell you right now. So basically 2K product just means that it has a hardener in it. A lot of times people, when they say 2K, they're referring to primers, but um, you know, 2K clears in this instance basically means it has a hardener. So traditionally in the past, you haven't been able to spray anything out of an aerosol that required a hardener because you can't mix inside of an aerosol can but that's changed so you can actually basically hit a button on this aerosol which mixes in the hardener and then it's only good for a short period of time 
But anyway, I've done one video in the past with the aerosols. People, for the most part, really liked it and they wanted to see more. So I'm going to try and satisfy that. But uh, it also winds up an entire portion of the population at the same time. I think it's just people are uncomfortable seeing an aerosol in a body shop and considering it a professional repair, which it is because these are all the same products, but the delivery is slightly different. But the end result, the finish actually looks quite good. I and mean, it definitely has a place in the refinish industry for most of the cutting in parts, just the convenience. You know, for the most part, you, you want a gun, I think, but there is a place in the actual industry, but I think it's more the D DIY guys like to see it. And I know that some people have attempted it and had some good results. So I'm going to show uh, some more of that and you should have lots of awesome videos to look forward to. Hopefully I can make the time for that. Life is just busy, so you know they don't roll out the same way as they used to. Always trying to improve that, and one day hopefully we'll get there. But for now, let's uh, enjoy what we've got here. So yeah, that's the Develbus Tecna base coat gun you're looking at, by the way, the blue gun. And that's, that's specifically designed for base coat, as the name implies. It's a little bit unique in the sense that it operates at 16 PSI at the inlet, so. It actually, it sounds like any other gun you might be running around, say 25, 26 PSI, so you put 16 in, it still sounds kind of like it's pouring on the material, but it's uh, it's been going over quite well. A lot of people I've spoken to really dig this gun. It's a nice gun. Another cool gun that you can expect to see some more of. You may have already seen it if you've been following Instagram or Facebook, is the Walcom Geo, which is a carbon fiber gun. Um, very lightweight as you would imagine and my initial thoughts was that it would be incredibly top heavy once you got the material on but it proved to not really be the case that's another gun that has gone over really well I've had a fair amount of people spray it that thought pretty highly of it I've done quite a few jobs used it for a yeah, basin clear it, you know it does the trick it's it's a nice gun I don't know well you'll have to wait for the detailed review on that and we'll talk a little bit more about that look at it. he's got the hose in the floor how many times do I get to tell him not to put that hose in the floor. It drives me nuts. He's just asking to throw dirt into it. He might as well just take a handful of dirt out of his pocket and throw it right in the middle of that door. So he's getting ready now to apply some clear coat and he's going to tack that job off first, just run a quick cloth over it to remove any debris debris that would have landed in between this last bit of base coat and now. And you saw that he did have to spot in an area, so he had to do a little bit of sanding to remove some sort of a paint defect or maybe dirt that landed in that quarter because he keeps throwing his hose on the floor. I don't know, but what has to happen if you do some sanding, you have to spot that back in by applying a little bit more paint to blend things out again. And then, of course, any time that happens, it costs you time in the booth and you have to wait. So here we are again now with the SATA 4000. And as far as clear coat, go, clear coat guns go, it's a pretty good clear coat gun. It's a very popular choice out there. Some guys really love this gun. I'm a little partial to it. I mean, it's a, it's a decent gun. Obviously, SATA doesn't make bad guns for the most part but I prefer the way the 3000 sprays and the 5000, which is the newer model in this, 
is like miles ahead in my opinion. I think the 5000 are both great guns. The RP for clear and the HVLP for base coat. And I've heard actually that sometimes some people use the RP even for base coat. I think with certain paints you can get away with it, but not all of them. Anyway, I like the HVLP for base coat. For clear coat, the Iwata WS400 is one of my favorite guns, as you are all well aware if you've been following this channel. But the SATA 5000, good gun. So let's talk a little bit about clear choices and different types of clears. So what you're faced with basically are two major kind of choices. You have a production clear or a general purpose all around clear. And the production clears are designed to dry extremely quick and minimize booth time. So rather than a lot of the times like this job here, for instance, we're not using a production clear, we're using an all around clear. And it's gonna require us to bake it and it'll probably sit in the, ba in the, the booth for about half hour, maybe up to 40 minutes and that's going to consume time and you want to get as many cars painted in a day as possible. So what some people might choose is a production clear which will minimize that so it could dry in about 20 minutes and then you get the job out the door and you get the next one in. So what happens, but the difference between both of them is production clears are typically a little bit tougher to spray, they usually dry a little quicker and they don't have the same level of the gloss so they might be more prone to dying back and giving you a less shiny of a finish. Most people probably wouldn't really notice, especially if it's on like your daily driver GMs and Chryslers and whatnot that don't come with this super high gloss finish. A lot of them have die back from the factory if you're paying attention, but you always want your paintwork to look as nice as possible, even if that means it has to be better than factory. Now the next choice you'll be faced with is which speed of hardener and reducer you'll want to use with your clear coat. Now not all clear coats have both a hardener and a reducer, some only have one and that's okay. But generally if they have two, you kind of want to stay within the same class. There's not usually a practical reason to say you use a slow hardener and a fast reducer. So basically you make that decision on the si combination of things, so the size of the job, uh, the temperature and the humidity. So in higher humidity and higher temperature, the clear is going to dry quicker than normal. So you'll want to use a slower drying hardener and reducer. So on a job like this, and it's around like 77 degrees in there, he's going to be using a medium hardener. So that's going to give him enough time to get across the three panels before the rest of the clear dries. And controlling products is not specific to clear coat. There's a lot of other choices or other products that you'll have to make these same choices with. Primers being one and also base coat. So yeah, I think you kind of have a bigger selection with solvents for the most part. When it comes to waterborne, it, the process is a little bit differently because water is really slowed down dramatically by humidity in the air because when there's more water in the air, water-based products have a harder time drying. So. The choices are made a little bit differently, but you still have to make them and figure out what the best choice of controllers or hardeners are for any given circumstance. Now there is one thing I might have done a little bit differently on that job and I probably would have started at the top and worked my way down just because 
At the top front edge of that door where he sprayed clear, he's spent quite a bit of time at the back and that could have skinned over by now. So when he comes to do this front edge here, the overspray from the pillar that's going to land on the door might not remelt back into that door and that would be dependent on the drying speed of the clear. So this is a medium all around clear. You'll probably be all right and some clears melt in better than others, but that would be something you could, you know, it could mess you up and it would result in maybe like a texture, texture kind of looking appearance at the front edge of that door where the overspray was and it would polish out afterwards, but it could just save you some headache if you plan ahead a little bit more. So looks like this one is in the books. Well, pretty close to it anyway, as far as the painting goes. Looks like a little bit of polishing might be required. And of course, it's gonna have to go off to assembly and all of that to get put back together, all the handles and everything put back in. But that's gonna do her for today. Let me know your thoughts and let me know your thoughts on the videos we've got planned and what you'd like to see. So you can follow all of the action on Instagram. We're the most active there and you can see what I'm up to and check us out on Facebook. A lot of stuff going on there on our page and I appreciate your support wherever you can give it to us. So thanks everyone again for watching and we will see you next time.